and welcome to another video of the Neat PG Coach. In this video, we'll be talking about heart sounds. As you all know, there are two heart sounds, S1 and S2. S1 is due to the closure of the mitral and tricuspid valves, and S2 is due to the closure of the aortic and pulmonic valves. And as you can see, uh, the second heart sound has got two components. Normally, if you see in the uh, normal tracing, you can see that there are two components of the second heart sound, A2 and P2. And also notice that A2 always precedes P2. That is the normal splitting of the second heart sound which occurs during inspiration. So what is the reason for this split? The reason for this split is, I would have explained in one of my earlier videos, what happens, the, the hemodynamic changes which happen during inspiration. For example, during inspiration, there is increased filling on the right side of the heart and there is decreased filling on the left side of the heart. The reason for that I would have told is inspiration uh, creates a negative pressure and that draws in more blood into the SVC, the IVC, consequently into the right atrium. So consequently, when you take a deep, deep breath, um, because there is decreased blood flow to the on the left side of the heart, the left ventricle could pump out all the blood earlier. But as there is increased blood flow to the right side of the heart, it takes more time for the right ventricle to pump out all the blood that it receives. So consequently, uh, there is a gap between A2 and P2. So this is called the physiological split. This is normally present in all people. <clears throat> now, during atrial septal defect, uh, especially the septum secundum atrial septal defect, there is fixed wide splitting of the second heart sound. The split is there, but there is no variation of the split with the respiratory cycle. So this is very important for you guys to know for your exam. Fixed wide split of the second heart sound occurs in atrial septum defect, septum secundum atrial septum defect. Okay. And that is about the S2 split. And about the S1 split, I just have one thing to say. The splitting of the first heart sound is not normally seen, but if it is seen, it is seen in young patients and those with the right bundle branch block. So these are the only two conditions where you see the S1 split, okay? And as I said before, S1 is due to the closure of the tricuspid, and, uh, tricuspid valve and the mitral valve. So the intensity of S1 depends on some of some of the following factors. And those are the distance traveled by the anterior mitral leaflet. The most mobile component of the mitral valve is the anterior mitral leaflet. As you all know, mitral valve is the bicuspid valve, the two cusps. This anterior mitral leaflet is the most mobile portion of that. And the distance traveled by the anterior mitral leaflet will determine the intensity of S1 and also the leaflet mobility and the PR interval and left ventricular contractility. For example, if the anterior mitral leaflet is thickened and calcified and becomes rigid, the intensity of S1 sharply declines, as you can see in advanced rheumatic mitral stenosis, and also the distance traveled by the anterior mitral leaflet. If the mitral leaflet travels for a long, for a long distance, the intensity of S1 increases. But if it has to travel only for a short distance, the intensity of S1 decreases. And the PR interval, for example, the PR interval is shortened. For example, the patient is having tachycardia and the PR interval is shortened. In these conditions, the intensity of S1 will increase. But if the PR interval is prolonged, for example, in a patient taking beta blockers, in those conditions, the intensity of S1 will decrease. And also the left ventricular contractility. The left ventricle is contracting like contracting very forcefully then in those circumstances also the intensity of s1 will increase but when there is left ventricular contractile dysfunction as in heart failure the intensity of s1 decreases and also the intensity of s1 can decrease by any process that increases the distance that increases the distance between the stethoscope and the responsive cardiac event so what do i mean by this you know, for example there are conditions like COPD, where there is increased AP diameter of the chest. Pneumothorax, pneumothorax, pericardial effusion. 
obesity. So what happens in these conditions is the distance between the stethoscope and the heart increases. And the viral chest deformity that you see in COPD, pneumothorax like air accumulating in the pleural space, thereby increasing the distance between the stethoscope and the heart. Pericardial diffusion, fluid in the pericardial sac, which also increases the distance between the heart, stethoscope and the heart. And obesity, where there is an increase of fatty tissue in the chest wall, which increases the distance between the stethoscope and the heart. So these conditions can also decrease intensity of S1. So I told you about conditions which increase the intensity of S1, which decrease the intensity of S1. About the second heart sound, like as I said before, the second heart sound has two components, the A2 and P2. A2 will always precede P2. Normally, the A2 P2 interval increases with inspiration and narrows during expiration. And that was because of the hemodynamic changes which take place during inspiration and expiration that I had explained in the very beginning of the video. The two conditions where the A2 P2 split will widen more are right mental branch block and mitral regurgitation. So as you can imagine, right mental branch block, there is a delay in conduction of impulses in the right side of the heart. So this will consequently delay the right ventricular emptying and thereby the pulmonic valve closure. So it takes more time for the right ventricle to contract and thereby empty its blood and thereby for the pulmonary valves to close. So right pedal branch block increases the A2-P2 split and also mitral regurgitation of course only seen in the early stages of mitral regurgitation as the regurgitation worsens of course there will be failure and unusually narrow split or a singular second heart sound is heard in pulmonary arterial hypertension and they also note that the intensity of p2 is higher the intensity of p2 is higher and the a2 and p2 come close by the reason for that is because of pulmonary hypertension, the right ventricle has to contract with the more force and thereby it, it, it does what it's supposed to do a little bit more quickly. So that will lead to a closed fixed splitting, which is characteristic of pulmonary hypertension. A wide fixed split, as I explained before, is seen in secundum ASD. It does not change with the respiratory cycle. The splitting happens, but it does not change with the respiratory cycle. Now, a very important thing for you to know for your exams is the reverse split or paradoxical split. The reverse split or paradoxical split occurs in the following conditions. Left mental branch block, right ventricular pacing, severe aortic stenosis, HOCM, acute myocardial ischemia. You don't have to memorize these things. Just think about it for a second. Reverse split or paradoxical split. Look at the diagram here. I said that A2 always precedes P2, but see here, P2 is preceding A2. So what happened here? Because there is something which is happening on the left side of the heart, which is delaying the aortic valve closure. And this could be aortic stenosis. For example, the, aorta, the aortic valve is stenosed. So it, it would take a long time for the left ventricle to empty all its blood out and thereby uh, close the aortic valve. So aortic valve closure happens only after the left ventricle is emptied out all its blood. So if aortic stenosis is there, there's going to be more time which is taken for the left ventricle to empty out all its blood. And the other condition would be HOCM, similar thing. Um, in HOCM, there is a dynamic obstruction of the left ventricular outflow tract. So more time is taken for the left ventricle to empty out all its blood and therefore uh, more time is taken for the aortic valve to close. So A2 comes after P2 in these two conditions. The other condition where A2 can come after P2 is if P2 is um, P2 occurs much earlier than A2. So where will this occur? This can occur in a right ventricular pacing. If you pace the right side of the heart, what happens is that P2 comes before A2. As you can see, right ventricular pacing, severe aortic stenosis, HOCM, and left mental branch block. If there is a conduction delay on the left side of the heart, what will happen? Um, there is more time which is taken for the left ventricle to pump out the blood, and thereby um, there is a delayed closure of the aortic valve, 
and therefore A2 comes after P2 and acute myocardial ischemia same same thing acute myocardial ischemia there is like the left ventricle is failing so for example consider a massive uh, anterior myocardial infarction the left ventricle is failing so it's, it takes more time to empty out its blood compared to the right side so acute myocardial ischemia so these are the five conditions like you don't even have to memorize if you just visualize these things it will automatically come to you you can easily pick out the odd one that's how they ask these questions in the exam like all of these conditions cost reverse split a paradoxical split except so these some of these five things might some of these five things might be there and there might be one odd thing so you can rule it out just by visualizing the things which happen in the cardiac cycle and the other thing that i have to say is about loud p2 so normally the a2 is the louder song as you can see here the intensity of a2 is higher except in c here pulmonary hypertension the intensity of p2 will be high so the s2 should not be heard at the apex or the level of sternal body it's heard only at the base the s2 is heard only at the base the other thing that we need to know about is a loud p2 as you know the p2 is a component of the second heart sound a2 and p2 normally the a2 is louder in density compared to p2 as you can see in the normal diagram here a2 is louder in density compared to p2 so when you're auscultating if you can if you can hear that the second component is louder at the base compared to the first component and also if you can palpate also if you can palpate the second heart sound you can conclude that it is due to a loud p2 or pulmonary hypertension how will you see when the patient is having pulmonary hypertension for example you are able to palpate the second heart sound in the left second intercostal space that is where the proximal pulmonary artery is situated or if you can hear that the second component when the second component of the S2 uh, exceeds that of the first component, you can say that there is pulmonary arterial hypertension, which is what has been mentioned here. The intensity of P2 exceeds that of A2 at the base, left second intercostal space, or when it can be palpated at the left second intercostal space. So this will tell you that the patient is having pulmonary hypertension and there is a loud P2. And when both components of S2 are heard at the apex or lower left sternal border, then also you can see that the patient is having pulmonary hypertension because the second component, that is P2, is not supposed to be heard at the apex or the lower left sternal border. But if you're able to appreciate the P2 or two components of the second heart sound at the apex and lower left sternal border, you can say that the patient is having a loud P2 or having a pulmonary hypertension. So once again to recap, once again to recap, uh, if the intensity of P2 exceeds that of A2 at the base, or if you can palpate um, the second heart sound in the left second intercostal space, you can clearly say that the patient is having pulmonary hypertension. The other condition is when you're able to appreciate both components of S2 at the apex and level of sternal border, because normally you're not supposed to hear the uh, P2 component at the apex or the lower left sternal border. And there are certain conditions which produce a single S2. Uh, those are aortic stenosis and pulmonary stenosis. So another important thing for you to know is uh, about the um, systolic sounds. Systolic sounds could be early systolic. Early systolic you usually found the you usually find the ejection sounds. For example, there when there is uh, aortic stenosis or pulmonic stenosis there is always um, the, the, you can always find these ejection sounds and these are always early systolic and they are best appreciated in the left lower sternal border and one important thing for you to know for your exams is about pulmonic stenosis so pulmonary stenosis is the only right-sided cardiac event that decreases in intensity with inspiration right-sided cardiac events are supposed to increase in intensity with inspiration Okay, so there is a general rule of thumb which says all right-sided cardiac events increase in intensity with inspiration and all left-sided cardiac events increase in intensity with expiration. So this is one exception to the rule. So this 
can potentially be tested in your exams. Pulmonic stenosis is the only right sided cardiac event that decreases in intensity with inspiration. And the injection sounds are early systolic. And when it comes to mid systole, you can, you can find this example of mitral valve prolapse where there is a mid systolic click followed by a murmur. So, as the mitral valve prolapses into uh, the left atrium, as the left ventricle contracts, you can find a mid systolic click. And after that prolapse, there might be blood flow across that mitral valve also. So, that can create a murmur. Mid systolic click followed by a murmur is seen in mitral valve prolapse. So, maneuvers which put more blood into the heart, like for example, squatting, squatting compresses the great veins and increases uh, the venous return to the heart basically puts more blood inside the heart. So in these conditions, um, what happens is that this uh, click murmur complex can move away from S1. So, so what, what's happening is it takes more time for the mitral valve to prolapse into uh, the left atrium. Because there is more blood inside the heart, it takes more time for it to prolapse and it takes more time for the murmur also to occur. So when you compare it in relation to S1, you can find that uh, the uh, click murmur complex is slightly moving away from S1. And on decreasing preload, for example, the patient is standing, that decreases venous return and puts uh, less blood less blood inside the heart. So in this condition, you can see that the click murmur complex is moving closer to S1. And there are only uh, two phases, like it could either be early systolic or it could be mid systolic And when it comes to systolic. Now, now about the diastolic heart sounds, um, you can fi hear five sounds during diastole. The opening snap, the pericardial knock, the S3 heart sound, S4 heart sound and tumor plop. Okay, the conditions in which you find these sounds are OS as you know is heard in mitral stenosis, pericardial knock and constrictor, pericarditis, <clears throat> S3 heart sound. Uh, it can be a physiological uh, variant in um, anemia, pregnancy, adolescence, and adults, athletic adults. The S4 heart sound is always pathological. It is heard in hypertension, hypertension where there is uh, LVH, okay. Uh, tumor plot, tumor plot is heard in atrial nixoma. So all these sounds are diastolic. So why are they diastolic? Uh, just uh, think about it for a second. Opening snap. <clears throat> Where does the opening snap occur? Opening snap occurs when the mitral valve snaps open. When will the mitral valve snap open? It's during diastole. So mitral stenosis and pericardial knock. In, ca in case of constrictive pericarditis, uh, where there is a membrane, a calcified membrane which is surrounding the heart, okay, when the heart expands, it expands and just hits this membrane. So when when will the heart be expanding? When it is filling with blood. And when does the heart fill with blood? During diastole. So pericardial knock in diastole. And S3 heart sound. S3 heart sound <clears throat> is heard during the rapid filling phase rapid ventricular filling phase. In one of the previous videos, I would have mentioned that ventricular filling has two phases, early rapid filling phase and a later phase which is slower and contraction dependent. This rapid filling phase is non-contraction dependent, meaning as soon as the valve opens, the blood just gushes in. So S3 heart sound is heard during the early rapid filling phase. And uh, Rapid filling phase is obviously during diastole, so you hear this. This is actually S3 heart sound is early diastolic. Early diastolic. Okay. And when there is this is heard when there is a volume overload state. For example, uh, when the mitral valve opens and there is a volume overloaded left ventricle, you can hear the S3 heart sound. So when will you have a volume overloaded left ventricle? Whenever there is like increased blood volume, like in pregnancy, like uh, like athletes, sometimes in adolescence, where there is increased blood volume, 
these conditions you can hear s3 heart sound and also one pathological condition where you hear the s3 heart sound is heart failure heart failure so in heart failure uh, when the heart is not pumping properly so obviously uh, the left ventricle would not have emptied properly so as soon as the mitral valve opens there will be more blood coming but there is already some blood here so the mitral valve when it opens when the ventricle is volume overloaded you hear a s3 heart sound an s4 heart sound you hear when the mitral valve opens and blood empties into a non-compliant and stiff and stiff left ventricle so where do you find a non-compliant and stiff ventricle could be left ventricle or left ventricle when do you find it uh, in case of left ventricle you can say that you find a non-compliant and stiff left ventricle in chronic hypertension okay aortic stenosis hocm in these conditions there will be muscular hypertrophy muscular hypertrophy so there is very little space for the blood to fill so there is very little space for the blood to fill and this ventricular wall will be stiff and non-compliant so also this happens the s4 heart sound happens during the atrial contraction remember i told that for the ventricular filling there are two phases early rapid filling phase and a late late later filling phase and this later filling phase is dependent on atrial contraction around 20 to 30 percent of blood is pumped from the atria into the ventricle during this phase and the early rapid filling phase is non-contraction dependent whereas this phase is contraction dependent so as the atria contracts it pushes the remaining 20 to 30 percent of blood and this blood when it comes into a non-compliant and stiff left ventricle or right ventricle <clears throat> you can hear the s4 heart sound okay so that is it and there is another terminology called right-sided s3 and left-sided s3 so third heart usually the s3 and s4 heart sounds are, are best heard in the apex apex left fifth intercostal space half inch medial to the medial to the midclavicular line apex but these are if it is a left-sided s3 or s4 it's best heard in the apex but if it's a right-sided s3 it is best heard in the left lower sternal border left lower sternal border okay so the take-home message is s3 hot sound is heard when the atria when the uh, mitral valve opens and blood empties into a volume overloaded ventricle s4 hot sound is heard when the mitral valve or tricuspid valve opens and uh, the blood empties into a pressure overloaded that is like a non-compliant or stiff ventricle uh, left or right ventricle so and also s3 is early, early diastolic s4 is late diastolic okay and uh, one more point for you to recap here is s4 i said is dependent on the atrial contraction what is the correlate to the jvp here the jvp the a wave of jvp corresponds to atrial contraction so there is a relation between a wave of jvp and the s4 heart sound so you might be asked about this relation in your exam and obviously the a wave is absent in atrial fibrillation so similarly, S4 heart sound will be absent in atrial fibrillation. Okay. So sometimes in patients with heart failure, you can hear S3 and S4 heart sounds. S3 and S4 heart sounds. So what you call this is gallop rhythm. Gallop rhythm, S3 and S4 heart sounds. So S1, S2, S3, S4. So these people will be having a gallop rhythm. So that is a sign of heart failure <clears throat> and one more thing last thing diastolic heart sound that you need to know about is the tumor plop tumor plop is heard let me tell you when it's heard tumor plop is heard when the tumor prolapses into the ventricle so that's a tumor and uh, oops 
of the pipe. Um, this is the atria, this is the ventricle, and there's a tumor. This is the stalk of the tumor, and this is the tumor proper. Okay, and this is the valve. So this is the atria, and this is the ventricle. For the case of atrial mixoma, as the mitral valve opens during diastole, the tumor might sometimes prolapse from the atria into the ventricle. So this is called a tumor flop. So sometimes this sound can also be heard during diastole. And of course, to confirm this, you do a 2D echo, and you see the prolapse, mass prolapsing into the ventricle every time, <coughs> every time there is a the contraction. So that is about the different heart sounds. In addition to these uh, physiological causes of S3, there are certain pathological causes of S3 also. So pathologically, you hear S3 in any volume or loaded state. Any volume or loaded state. And that can be CHF, congestive heart failure, mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation, ASD, VSD, PDA. So any volume overloaded state can create a S3 heart sound. And there are certain physiological conditions also, as I said before, it could be uh, pregnancy, young athletes, children, anemia, sometimes even hyperthyroidism.